the frontispiece to Europe of Prophecy would have been immediately recognizable to Blake's contemporaries as the god of deism and the age of reason, a deity who had established the stable laws of nature and given man the rational mind to discover and exploit them. Blake took a less exuberant view of science and progress. He saw the god of the age of reason as a false one, imposing technological tyranny and one-size-fits-all morality. We should bear in mind that the notion of God as a mathematician is as old as Egypt, and in fact was something of a cliché by the time Proverbs declared he set a compass upon the face of the deep. This image, from an early 13th century Bible explained in the collection of the Austrian National Library, is a particularly clear but by no means rare example of the motif, and Blake was unquestionably familiar with similar ones. Note that in the medieval version, God is setting in order a sacred cosmos. In his hand, he holds the golden sphere of the primum mobile, which gives motion to all the stars set in their blue zone. The next layer in holds the bright planets and the fiery sun, which circle the still-forming earth with its moon. This entire universe is sustained by the hand of a very aware and involved god, whose round halo, like the round cosmos, is a circle representing perfection and completeness. Blake's image is just the opposite. This god, Eurizen, is entirely enclosed within clouds of error, in which he crouches in the very limited enlightenment he claims as his exclusive prerogative. He is looking down, closely focused on his task. The medieval deity's wide eyes advertised his omniscience. Eurizen's lowered lids show how little he sees or understands. He leans out to examine black nothingness, the measurable but impenetrable opacity of the material world. Blake describes the work of this evil deity using the serpent to represent his materialist view of existence, reptile cold and coiled in complexity. Then was the serpent temple formed, image of infinite shut up in finite revolutions, and man became an angel, heaven a mighty circle turning, God a tyrant crowned. The snake of materialism elaborates himself in curlicues that return him back upon himself like a circular argument. He crushes the fires of eternity and art beneath his cold, dark volutions. The young traveler, who represents revolutionary experiment, walks through wilderness along the spiral path and gawks at a new world without looking where he's going. He will be an easy prey for the bandit that hides in the cave. The darkness and the stones that enclose the robber suggest a mental imprisonment, an intellectual trap. The robber is nude and shows by his skin coloring and his self-enclosing limbs that he is an echo and emblem of the cave itself, the cul-de-sac of new problems into which the idealistic revolutionary is sure to fall. The robber's dagger suggests the violent solutions which are always appealing to utopian dreamers. Below, we see the face of a man whose arms are wrapped around his neck, trapped in a batwing frame. In an uncolored plate, his misery is easier to read. To his right, a bound man is dragged downward head first by a weight. These are emblems of the enlightenment turned into endarkenment, the way of nature which our young revolutionary was pursuing with such optimism above proves to be unpleasantly natural, as the spider, worm, and flies suggest. Before proceeding to the next plate, we should also understand the robber in the cave as the caverned man described in the poetic preface, whose awareness is limited to what enters through the five windows of the senses. He is naked because he is man in a state of nature, a concept which all the Enlightenment philosophers appealed to as they sought a scientific basis for their political systems. What they found in nature was a world of Darwinian strife and competition. And this is the subject of the next plate. In the prelude to the poem, The Shadowy Female, that is, Nature, 
laments that in her fallen state she must bring forth beings whose existence will be a battle to survive. Fiery, devouring kings, devouring and devoured, roaming on dark and desolate mountains, in forests of eternal death, shrieking in hollow trees. One figure at top, horrified, abandons the strife. The cross drawn on a door with the words, Lord have mercy on us, indicated that the persons living within were infected with the plague and that the house had been shut up to prevent the disease from spreading. The bellman would ring to call for the death cart to remove the corpses. Blake uses plague as a metaphor for any national scourge, social, economic, medical or otherwise, all of which would be relevant in time of revolution and reaction. A scene within the afflicted house the death of the young, or perhaps of hope, which afflicts both rich, the woman with the pearl necklace, and the poor, the barefoot woman. The pot on the enormous fire suggests the political situation, overheated beyond control and about to boil over. Atop the first page, we have a panorama of the revolutionary paradise. As we see on either side of the letter A, now even plants appear in their eternal form as intelligent beings, thus the nearly human shapes of the willow at left and the fruiting date palm at right. Airborne fairies, that is, spirits of sexual delight, model reluctant or ambivalent love, which is wingless, and shared passion, which is fully angelic. Tiny figures enjoy themselves among the letters of prophecy. One climbs up the first P. A parent receives a flying child at the base of the R, while someone reads in that letter's final curve. A shepherd and flocks are framed in the O. A figure is climbing the Y to join his friend who already walks along its top onto the C, while another reader sits in the word's final flourish. In the clouds at center is a vaguely indicated hunched-over figure, which places a visual question mark in the midst of the upper oval's idol. A mourning winged figure dominates the plate. This is Inatharman. She, together with her consort Los, represents the imagination. For Blake, the relationship between Los and Inatharman is echoed in the conflict between male and female in human society. Blake was deeply critical of his time's high valuation of female modesty and chastity, which he saw as tools of social control, which gave women an illusory and self-destructive social power. Thus, Inatharman here has angel's wings and is very modestly dressed to show her claim to heavenly purity. The result of the sexual repression she chooses and fosters is the birth of Orc, thwarted love asserting itself as rebellion, represented as the fiery child in the orb which has fallen into birth from Enatharman's pained head. In the poem, Enatharman is delighted by the birth of Orc, for she believes she can control and exploit the power of repressed Eros. Enatharman gains dominion over the other Eternals through sexual repression, and Blake equates this with the general rejection of the world that was basic to medieval Christian culture. He has Inatharman say, Go, tell the human race that woman's love is sin, that an eternal life awaits the worm of sixty winters in an allegorical abode where existence hath never come. Forbid all joy, and from her childhood shall the little female spread nets in every secret path. In the lower part of the plate, we see images of the world under Enatharman's control. A clothed female figure watches the flight of birds. Flight, equated with erotic play in the figures at top, is something she is now content to watch from afar. A figure with a serpentine trumpet announces the birth of Orc and is being joined by a clothed flying spirit, one of Enatharman's chaste minions delighting in the new power contained orc puts at their disposal. The further figures continue the theme of Enatharman's reign of denial. Above the word then, one figure offers itself to another, 
which is repelled by an invisible force. Above the last stanza, a man crawls over the desert expanse towards a naked female, who awaits him with studied nonchalance. In a completing pendant to the preceding plate, we see Ina Tharman in her true form, as the queen of sexual repression, manipulating the unconscious like a succubus. In the fiery clouds of erotic dreaming, we see figures that are playful, lewd, ecstatic, spent, and pensive, like a ballet of masturbation fantasies, which Ina Tharman calls the night of holy shadows and human solitude. Over the sleeping form of Orc, Enatharman hovers with arms extended, obviously to lift the bedsheet, but also in a way that suggests she is casting a spell, which in a very real sense she is. The naked youth's head flames with erotic heat, explosively colored. Enatharman is both of the female figures here. On the right, she advises with prayerful persuasion the scaly King of England to repress the American Revolution and keep the fires of Orc safely depressed under his feet. The King looks sad and baffled, but his reptile hide, his dragon form, shows that he is ready for war. At left, another triumphant Inatharman figure looks on smugly. Another explicatory pendant. The inside story behind the warlike king and dragon armor is a frightened old man, the old regime, attempting to ward off the future. Those dependent on him implore him not to rashly react. Fairies, spirits of sexual pleasure, blow the trumpets of rebellion, from which emerge black mildews to blight the grain stalk that encircles them. In Blake, Plagues and blightings are metaphoric for any sort of social affliction, from war to pestilence to economic damage. The notion here is that the reprisals taken against the revolutionaries in America rebound against the establishment. The snake, which we saw as a symbol of physical nature on the title page, is also used, as here, as an emblem of orc who is revolution. Orc's form alludes to the serpent which tempts humankind to disobey the tyrant god and taste the forbidden fruit of mystical experience. Here he rises on his spirals, standing upright like a human. His body is bright with the colors of life and crowned with the flaming halo of artistic creation. Here the relevant text is very conveniently and prominently placed in the picture. Albion's angel rose upon the stone of night. He saw you reason on the Atlantic, and his brazen book that kings and priests had copied on earth expanded from north to south. Albion's angel is the king or government, which sees itself as the nation's guardian angel. He wears a papal tiara, but we should recall that the English monarch is also the head of the Church of England. The brazen book is the positivist codes of modern law which favor only the strong while claiming to protect the individual. They have expanded from north to south, that is, they claim to be universally true. The interpretation of the image as the English king opposing the American Revolution is the primary one, but this meaning is overlaid by a second. This poem also introduces Blake's interpretation of the Middle Ages. He reason and his brazen book that kings and priests had copied on earth. This is a vision of medieval Christendom, with guardian angels of the nations lowering their royal scepters to papal authority. Note that the angels have dragon tails. The legitimacy of the spirits of nations depends on their military power. The Pope here, the one who stands in place of Christ on earth, is your reason, the faculty of reason, ruling the world in the form of theology. The bat wings here, as on the prelude page, indicate the intellectual fetters of ignorance and superstition, a point emphasized by the Gothic arches behind the figures which, by a visual echo, are equated with the bat wings. 
the web of your reason's religion. This can be understood not only in terms of superstition and the cult of chastity, but in modern capitalist terms, a world of spiders and flies, predators and prey, consumers and consumed. A person at bottom, completely immobilized by belief in the system, stares up at the cathedral ceiling of webwork and prays to the arachnid lords of life. A prison scene, which suggests the old regime's reprisals against revolutionary dissidents. The little spider in the text indicates that the manacled man below has committed thought crime, tried to tear the web, and learned that it is strong as iron chains. There are butterflies and flowering plants above, then the birds who feed on spiders, worms, and caterpillars, and the snails that feed on plants. At bottom, snakes creep along the ground or up a plant, perhaps to eat eggs from the nests of the birds. It is a more benign version of the spider world of unbridled consumption, a prettier but still doomed world of physical nature. The poem ends describing how Orc will make France glow red with the fires of revolution. It is illustrated by Los, the imagination, rescuing a woman and a child from Orc's conflagration. The broken pillar suggests the destruction of the old order. <laughs>